In the heart of Paris, one man dreamed of a monument unlike anything the world had ever seen. Gustave Eiffel's Iron Tower was mocked by critics, yet destined to become a global icon. Behind its elegance lay struggles, sinking foundations, tilting legs, and even the threat of demolition just 20 years later. How did this iron monster survive to become the pride of France? Today, we uncover the untold story of its rise, from the riverbank mud to the clouds above Paris. In the late 1880s, as Gustave Eiffel and his team prepared to raise their monumental tower in the heart of Paris, they faced an enormous challenge even before the first iron beam was lifted into place. The site chosen for the Eiffel Tower straddled a patch of land along the Seine River, and the ground conditions varied dramatically. Two of the tower's legs would stand on firm, dry soil, while the other two were dangerously close to the riverbank where the earth was soft, muddy, and saturated with water. If this wasn't solved, the entire structure risked becoming unstable, potentially tilting like the infamous Leaning Tower of Pisa. For the two legs farthest from the river, the solution was relatively straightforward. Workers dug massive rectangular pits about 7 meters deep until they reached solid, compact soil. At the bottom of these pits, they poured thick layers of concrete to create a solid base. From there, they built enormous limestone masonry piers designed to distribute the immense weight of the iron tower evenly into the ground. As these piers rose, their wide bases acted as massive footings, efficiently channeling and dispersing the colossal forces into the earth below. At the top of each pier, Eiffel's engineers embedded gigantic steel anchor bolts, some nearly 7.5 meters long, engineered to clamp the iron legs of the tower firmly in place. But on the riverside, a much greater challenge awaited. Here, digging into the wet soil caused water to flood in immediately. To combat this, Eiffel's engineers turned to an innovative and risky technique for the time, compressed air caissons. These were gigantic, hollow iron boxes placed upside down on the ground, open at the bottom and sealed at the top. Rising from the working chamber was a vertical access shaft, which connected it to the surface and allowed workers, tools, and excavated soil to move in and out. Above ground, a working platform housed air compressors to maintain pressure, ventilation pipes for fresh air, and cranes or pulleys to lift soil and materials. Deep below, compressed air was pumped into the caissons, building up enough pressure to drive out water and mud. This ingenious system created a dry, pressurized workspace beneath the river's water table, allowing workers to dig safely below the same. A vertical shaft connected the pressurized working chamber to the surface, acting as the main route for moving workers, tools, and excavated soil in and out of the caisson. Within this shaft, a ladder or hoist system allowed workers to access the chamber efficiently. As they dug deeper, the heavy caissons slowly sank under their own weight, inching down through the soft soil until they finally reached a layer of firm, load-bearing earth, almost 15 meters below the surface. Once securely in place, the caissons were filled entirely with concrete, forming enormous solid blocks deep underground. On top of these concrete bases, limestone piers were constructed, just like on the dry side. The final touch was the installation of massive cast iron anchor bolts, each about 7.5 meters long, embedded in the concrete to hold the tower's iron legs firmly in place. After completing the footings, a perimeter retaining wall was constructed around the rectangular foundation pit. This wall served to stabilize the surrounding soil, prevent erosion, and protect the foundation from water seepage and collapse during construction. On the riverbank side, the ground was soft, waterlogged, and unstable. 
To safely manage these challenging conditions, Eiffel's engineers built a curved retaining wall around the foundation pit. This arch design functioned much like an inverted dam, allowing the wall to better resist lateral pressure from the surrounding soil and water. It distributed the forces more evenly and helped prevent collapse or seepage. The shape was not for appearance, but a critical structural adaptation, redirecting pressure into the ground and ensuring stability during and after construction. Built from masonry, it provided a clean boundary and secure working environment as the project moved upward from the ground into the iron assembly phase. After months of painstaking work preparing the foundations, it was finally time for the Eiffel Tower to rise. On July 1, 1887, the first prefabricated iron pieces arrived at the construction site, ready to be assembled. Unlike traditional stone monuments, the Eiffel Tower was built from 18,038 wrought iron parts, all forged and pre-fitted at Eiffel's factory near Paris. The construction team began work on all four legs at the same time, a move that required extraordinary precision. Each leg was built at a slant, gradually angling inward as they climbed higher, so even the slightest misalignment could have thrown the entire tower off balance. Raising the tower's legs was far from straightforward. Because each leg leaned sharply inward, the structure was under constant strain from its own weight, making it prone to shifting or collapse. To overcome this, Eiffel's engineers built an intricate network of temporary wooden scaffolding, diagonal struts, and cantilevered supports. These stabilizing structures braced the ironwork at every stage, keeping the legs securely aligned as they rose toward the first platform. At the base of each leg, hydraulic jacks were installed. These ingenious devices allowed engineers to make micro-adjustments to the height and angle of the legs as construction progressed. Even a difference of a few millimeters could have caused the legs to miss their target at the first platform, so every measurement was triple-checked with precision instruments. Once the jacks were in place, engineers began the delicate task of fine-tuning the position of each leg during assembly. As iron sections were added and the legs grew taller, the jacks allowed for small but critical shifts, raising, lowering, or tilting each leg as needed to maintain perfect alignment. Surveying teams constantly monitored the angles and distances using optical instruments and plumb lines, ensuring that all four legs advanced uniformly toward the central point. This careful calibration continued until the legs reached the first platform, 57 meters above the ground, where they needed to connect seamlessly. Thanks to the precision of the hydraulic system and constant oversight, the margin of error was kept within a few millimeters, an extraordinary feat for the late 19th century. Once the legs were perfectly aligned, Work began on the central support framework, a temporary lattice of steel beams erected in the middle of the tower's footprint. Acting like a spine, it gave workers a stable reference point for measuring angles and ensuring flawless connections. Around this core, massive curved iron arcs were assembled on each of the four sides. Each arc, weighing dozens of tons, was far more than a decorative flourish, they were vital load-bearing elements, channeling forces between the legs and giving the tower its iconic sweeping base profile. Erecting these arcs was a feat of engineering. They were assembled piece by piece on the ground, then hoisted into position using a system of winches and cranes mounted directly on the growing legs of the tower. The moment they were connected, the tower's stability improved dramatically, locking the legs together like a giant iron frame. After the successful completion of the first floor at 57 meters, the most difficult phase of the Eiffel Tower's construction was behind them. The legs were now firmly locked together by the arcs and platform, which acted like a giant brace, stabilizing the entire structure. From this point forward, the assembly process became both faster and more efficient.
Above the first platform, the tower's geometry changed. The legs, while still slanting inward, rose more vertically and with less curvature, making the ironwork easier to align. Without the extreme stresses and precarious angles of the lower section, the need for massive scaffolding and hydraulic adjustments diminished. Instead, cranes mounted directly on the first platform lifted prefabricated iron pieces upward, where teams of riveters, blacksmiths, and laborers secured them into place. The speed of construction between the first and second floors amazed the public. What had taken months of painstaking adjustments below now progressed at nearly double the pace, proving that Eiffel's design was not just bold, but brilliantly practical. By mid-1888, the tower had risen past 100 meters, and the second platform was beginning to take shape at 115 meters above ground. Just like the first floor, this platform was built with a framework of heavy iron beams, carefully bolted and riveted into place to form a rigid square that tied the four legs together once again. It provided not only strength and stability, but also a crucial working base for the final push to the upper levels. Above the second platform, the engineering challenges shifted. The structure grew lighter as the lattice trusses narrowed, but the risks multiplied. At such heights, strong winds swept across Paris, forcing workers to cling to iron beams as the tower swayed ever so slightly beneath their feet. Winter cold and rain made conditions even harsher, yet progress continued with remarkable speed. By March 1889, the third platform, perched at 276 meters, was complete. Only the slender spire remained, designed not merely as an ornamental crown but as a bold statement to push the tower past the symbolic 300-meter mark. When it opened in May 1889, the Eiffel Tower astonished the world. Once mocked as a monstrous skeleton, it became the pride of Paris and the tallest structure on earth. Though originally meant to be dismantled after 20 years, Eiffel secured its survival by proving its value for science and wireless telegraphy. Today, the tower stands as a global icon of ingenuity and ambition. From its deep foundations to its soaring spire, it remains a lasting symbol of vision and perseverance, an engineering marvel that has endured far beyond its critics' expectations.